Hello and welcome to Harper Reads. We are going to start chapter three of The Hound of the Baskervilles. It's called The Problem. I confess that at these words a shudder passed through me. There was a thrill in the doctor's voice which showed me that he was himself deeply moved by that which he told us. Holmes leaned forward in his excitement and his eyes had the hard, dry glitter which shot from them when he was keenly interested. You saw this? As clearly as I see you. And you said nothing? What was the use? How was it that no one else saw it? The marks were some twenty yards from the body and no one gave them a thought. I don't suppose I should have done so had I not known of the, this legend. There are many sheepdogs on the moor? No doubt, but this was no sheepdog. You say it was large. Enormous. But it had not approached the body. No. What sort of night was it? Damp and raw. But not actually raining? No. What is the alley like? There are two lines of old yew hedge, 12 feet high and impenetrable. The walk in the center is about eight feet across. Is there anything between the hedges and the walk? Yes, there is a strip of grass about six feet broad on either side. I understand that the yew hedge is penetrated at one point by a gate. Yes, the wicket gate, which leads to on to the moor. Is there any other opening? None. So that to reach the yew alley, one either has to come down it from the house or else to enter it by the moor gate? There is an exit through a summer house at the far end. Had Sir Charles reached this? No, he lay about 50 yards from it. Now, tell me, Dr. Mortimer, and this is important. The marks which you saw were on the path and not on the grass. No marks could show on the grass. Were they on the same side of the path as the moor gate? Yes, they were on the edge of the path on the same side as the moor gate. You interest me exceedingly. Another point. Was the wicket gate closed? Closed and padlocked. How high was it? About four feet high. Then anyone could have gotten over it. Yes. And what marks did you see by the wicket gate? None in particular. Good heavens! Did no one examine? Yes, I examined myself. And found nothing? It was all very confused. Sir Charles had evidently stood there for about five or ten minutes. How do you know that? Because the ash had dropped twice from his cigar. Excellent. This is a colleague, Watson, after our own hearts. But the marks? Well, he had left his own marks all over the small patch of gravel. I could discern no others. Sherlock Holmes struck his hand against his knee with an impatient gesture. If I had only been there, he cried, it is evidently a case of extraordinary interest and one which presented immense opportunities to the scientific experiment expert. That gravel page upon which I might have read so much has been long ere this smudged by the rain and defaced by the clogs of curious peasants. Oh, Dr. Mortimer, Dr. Mortimer, to think that you should not have called me in. You have indeed much to answer for. I could not call you in, Mr. Holmes, without disclosing these facts to the world, and I have already given my reasons for not wishing to do so. Besides, besides! Why do you hesitate? There is a realm in which the most acute and most experienced of detectives is helpless. You mean that the thing is supernatural? I did not positively say so. No, but you evidently think so. Since the tragedy, Mr. Holmes, there have come to my ears several incidents which are hard to reconcile with the, settle, with the settled order of nature. For example, 
I find that before the terrible event occurred, several people had seen a creature upon the moor which corresponds with this Baskerville demon, and which could not possibly be any animal known to science. They all agreed that it has a it was a huge creature, luminous, ghastly, and spectral. I have cross-examined these men, one of them a hard-headed countryman, one a farrier, and one a moorland farmer, who all tell the same story of this dreadful apparition exactly corresponding to the hellhound of the legend. I assure you that there is a reign of terror in the district, and that it is hardly it is a hardy man who will cross the moor at night. And you, a trained man of science, believe it to be supernatural? I do not know what to believe. Holmes shrugged his shoulders. I have hitherto confined my investigations to this world, he said. In a modest way, I have combated evil, but to take on the father of evil himself would perhaps be too ambitious a task. Yet you must admit that the footmark is material. The original hound was material enough to tug a man's throat out, and yet he was diabolical as well. I see that you have quite gone over to the supernaturalists. But now, Dr. Mortimer, tell me this. If you hold these views, why have you come to consult me at all? You tell me in the same breath that it is useless to investigate Sir Charles's death, and that you desire me to do it. I did not say I desired you to do it. Then how can I assist you? By advising me as to what I should do with Sir Henry Baskerville, who arrives at Waterloo Station. Dr. Mortimer looked at his watch. In exactly one hour and a quarter. He being the heir. Yes. On the death of Sir Charles, we inquired for this young gentleman and found that he had been farming in Canada. From the accounts which have reached us, he is an excellent fellow in every way. I speak now not as a medical man, but as a trustee and executor of Sir Charles's will. There is no other claimant, I, assume, I presume? None. The only other kinsman whom we have been able to trace was Roger Baskerville, the youngest of three brothers, of whom poor Sir Charles was the elder. The second brother, who died young, is the father of this lad, Henry. The third, Roger, was the black sheep of the family. He came to the old masterful Baskerville stra strain and was the very image, they tell me, of the family picture of old Hugo. He made England too hot to hold him, fled to Central America, and died there in 1876 of yellow fever. Henry is the last of the Baskervilles. In one hour and five minutes, I meet him at Waterloo Station. I have had a wire that he arrived at Southampton this morning. Now, Mr. Holmes, what would you advise me to do with him? Why should he not go to the home of his fathers? It seems natural, does it not? And yet, consider that every Baskerville who goes there meets with an evil fate. I feel sure that if Sir Charles could have spoken with me before his death, he would have warned me against bringing this, the last of the old race, and the heir to the great wealth, to that deadly place. And yet it cannot be denied that the prosperity of the whole poor, bleak countryside depends upon his presence. All the good work which has been done by Sir Charles will crash to the ground if there is no tenant in the hall. I fear lest I should be swayed too much by my own obvious interest in the matter, and that is why I bring the case before you and ask for your advice. Holmes considered for a little time. Put into plain words the matter this is, is this, he said. In your opinion, there is a diabolical agency which makes Dartmoor an unsafe abode for a Baskerville. This is your opinion. At least I might go to the length of saying that there is some evidence that may be so. Exactly. But surely, if your supernatural theory be correct, it could work the young man evil in London. It could work the young man evil in London as easily as in Devonshire. A devil with merely local powers, like a parish vestry, would be too inconceivable a thing. You put the matter more flippantly, Mr. Holmes, than you would probably do if you were brought into personal contact with these things. Your advice, then, as I understand it, is that the young man will be as safe in Devonshire as in London. He comes in fifty minutes. What would you recommend? I recommend, sir, that you take a cab, call off your spaniel who is scratching at my front door, and proceed to Waterloo to meet Sir Henry Baskerville. And then, and then, you will say nothing to him at all until you have made up your mind about, until I have made up my mind about the matter. How long will it take you to make up your mind? 
24 hours. At 10 o'clock tomorrow, Dr. Mortimer, I will be much obliged to you if you will call upon me here, and it will be of help to me in my plans for the future if you will bring Sir Henry Baskerville with you. I will do so, Mr. Holmes. He scribble, scribbled the appointment on his shirt cuff and hurried off in his strange, peering, absent-minded fashion. Holmes stopped him at the head of the stair. Only one more question, Dr. Mortimer. You say that before Sir Charles Baskerville's death, several people saw this apparition upon the moor? Three people did. Did any see it after? I have not heard of any. Thank you. Good morning. Holmes returned to his seat with that quiet look of inward satisfaction, which meant that he had a congenial task before him. Going out, Watson? Unless I can help you. No, my dear fellow, it is at the hour of action that I turn to you for aid. But this is splendid, really unique from some points of view. When you pass Bradley's, would you ask him to send up a pound of the strongest shag tobacco? Thank you. It would be as well if you could make it convenient not to return before evening. Then I should be very glad to compare impressions as to this most interesting problem which has been submitted to us this morning. I knew that seclusion and solitude were very necessary for my friend in those hours of intense mental concentration during which he weighed every particle of evidence, constructed alternative theories, balanced one against the other, and made up his mind as to which points were essential and which immaterial. I therefore spent the day at my club and did not return to Baker Street until evening. It was nearly nine o'clock when I found myself in the sitting room once more. My first impression as I opened the door was that a fire had broken out, for the room was filled with smoke that the light by the lamp upon the table was blurred by it. As I entered, however, my fears were set to rest, for it was just it was the acrid fumes of strong coarse tobacco which took me by the throat and set me coughing. Through the haze, I had a vague vision of Holmes in his dressing gown, coiled up in an armchair with his black clay pipe between his lips. Several rolls of paper lay around him. Caught cold, Watson, he said. No, it's this poisonous atmosphere. I suppose it is pretty thick, now that you mention it. Thick? It is intolerable. Open the window, then. You have been at your club all day, I perceive. My dear Holmes. Am I right? Certainly. But how? He laughed at my bewildered expression. There is a delightful freshness about you, Watson, which makes it a pleasure to exercise any small powers which I possess at your expense. A gentleman goes forth on a showery and miry day. He returns immaculate in the evening with the gloss still at, on his hat and his boots. He has been a fixture, therefore, all day. He is not a man with intimate friends. Where, then, could he have been? Is it not obvious? Well, it is rather obvious. The world is full of obvious things which nobody by any chance ever observes. Where do you think that I have been? A fixture also. On the contrary, I have been to Devonshire. In spirit? Exactly. My body has remained in this armchair and has, I regret to observe, consumed in my absence two large pots of coffee and an incredible amount of tobacco. After you left, I sent down to Stamford's for the ordinance ordinance map of this portion of the moor, and my spirit has hovered over it all day. I flatter myself that I could find my way about. A large-scale map, I presume? Very large. He unrolled one section and held it over his knee. Here you have the particular district which concerns us. That is Baskerville Hall in the middle. With a wood around it? Exactly. I fancy the yew alley though not marked under that name, must stretch along this line with the moor, as you perceive, upon the right of it. This small clump of buildings here is the hamlet of Grimpen, where our friend Dr. Mortimer has his headquarters. Within a radius of five miles, there are, as you see, only a few scattered dwellings. Here is Laughter Hall, which was mentioned in the narrative. There is a house indicated here, which may be the residence of the naturalist, Stapleton, if I remember right was his name, here are two moorland farmhouses, High Tor and Falmere. Then, fourteen miles away, the great convict prison of Princetown. Between and around these scattered points extends the desolate, lifeless moor. This, then, is the stage upon which tragedy has been played, and upon which we may help it play it to play it again. It must be a wild place. Yes, the setting is a worthy one. If the devil did desire to have a hand in the affairs of men... Then 
you are yourself inclining to the supernatural explanation? The devil's agents may be of flesh and blood, may they not? There are two questions waiting for us at the outset. The one is whether any crime has been committed at all. The second, what is the crime and how was it committed? Of course, if Dr. Mortimer's surmise should be correct, and we are dealing with forces outside the ordinary laws of nature, there is an end to our, of our investigation. But we are bound to exhaust all other hypotheses before falling back upon this one. I think we'll shut that window again if you don't mind. It is a singular thing, but I find that a concentrated atmosphere helps a concentration of thought. I have not pushed it to the length of getting into a box to think, but this, that is the logical outcome of my convictions. Have you turned the case over in your mind? Yes, I have thought a great good deal of it in the course of the day. What do you make of it? I mean, it is very bewildering. It has certainly a character of its own. There are points of distinction about it that change in the footprints, for example. What do you make of that? Mortimer said that the man had walked on tiptoe down that portion of the alley. He only repeated what some fool had said at the inquest. Why should a man walk on tiptoe down the alley? What then? He was running, Watson, running desperately, running for his life, running until he burst his heart and fell dead upon his face. Running from what? There lies our problem. There are indications that the man was crazed with fear before he, before ever he began to run. How can you say that? I am presuming that the cause of his fears came to him across the moor. If that were so, and it seems most probable, only a man who had lost his wits would have run from the house instead of toward it. If the gypsy's evidence may be taken as true, he ran with cries for help in the direction where help was least likely to be. Then again, whom was he waiting for that night, and why was he waiting for him in the yew alley rather than in his own house? You think he was waiting for someone? The man was elderly and infirm. We can understand that him his taking an evening stroll, but the ground was damp and the night, and the night inclement. Is it natural that he should stand for five or ten minutes, as Dr. Mortimer with more practical sense than I should have given him for, deduced from the cigar ash. But he was out. He went out every evening. I think it unlikely that he waited at the moor gate every evening. On the contrary, the evidence is that he avoided the moor. That night, he waited there. It was the night before he, he made his departure for London. The thing takes shape, Watson. It becomes coherent. Might I ask you to hand me my violin, and we will postpone any further thought upon this business until we have had the advantage of meeting Dr. Mortimer and Sir Henry Baskerville in the morning. The end of chapter three. All right, I'm gonna pause for a drink break. So give me just a second, guys. Mm Chapter 4, Sir Henry Baskerville. Our breakfast table was cleared early and Holmes waited in his dressing gown for the promised interview. Our clients were punctual to their appointment, for the clock had just struck ten when Dr. Mortimer was shown up, followed by the young baronet. The latter was a small, alert, dark-eyed man, about thirty years of age, very sturdily built, with thick black eyebrows and a strong, pugnacious face. He wore a ruddy-tinted tweed suit and had the weather-beaten appearance of one who has spent most of his time in the open air, and yet there was something in his steady eye and the quiet assurance of his bearing which indicated the gentleman. 
This is Sir Henry Baskerville, said Dr. Mortimer. Why, yes, he said, said he, and the strange thing is, sure, Mr. Sherlock Holmes, that if my friend here had not proposed coming round to you this morning, I should have come on my own account. I understand that you think out little puzzles, and I've had one this morning which wants me more thinking out than I am able to give it. Pray take a seat, Sir Henry. Do I understand you to say that you have yourself had <clears throat> some remarkable experience since you arrived in London? Nothing of much importance, Mr. Holmes. Only a joke, as like as not. It was this letter, if you can call it a letter, which reached me this morning. He laid an envelope upon the table, and we all bent over it. It was of common quality, grayish in color. The address, Sir Henry Baskerville, Northumberland Hotel, was printed in rough characters, the postmark Charing Cross, and the date of post posting the preceding evening. Who knew that you were going to the Northumberland Hotel? asked Holmes, glancing keenly across at our visitor. No one could have known. We only decided after I met Dr. Mortimer. But Dr. Mortimer was no doubt already stopping there? No, I had been staying with a friend, said the doctor. There was no possible indication that we intended to go to this hotel. Hum, someone seems to be very deeply interested in your movements. Out of the envelope, he took a half sheet of full scrap paper folded into four. Then he opened and spread flat upon the table. Across the middle of it, a single sentence had been formed by the expedient of passing printed words upon it. It ran, As you value your life or your reason, keep away from the more. The word more only was printed in ink. Now, said Sir Henry Baskerville, perhaps you will tell me, Mr. Holmes, what in thunder is the meaning of that, and who it is? is that takes so much interest in my affairs. What do you make of it, Dr. Mortimer? You must allow that there is nothing supernatural about this at any rate. No, sir, but it might very well come with, come from someone who was convinced that the business is supernatural. What business? asked Sir Henry sharply. It seems to me that all you gentlemen know a great deal more than I do about my own affairs. You shall share our knowledge before you leave this room, Sir Henry, I promise you that, said Sherlock Holmes. We will confine ourselves for the present, with your permission, to this very interesting document, which must have been put together and posted yesterday evening. Have you yesterday's times, Watson? It is right here in the corner. Might I trouble you for it? The inside page, please, with the leading articles. He glanced swiftly over it, running his eyes up and down the columns. Capital article, this on free trade. Permit me to give you an ex extract from it. You may be con cajoled into imagining that your own special trade uh, or your own industry will be encouraged by a protective tariff, but it stands to reason that such legislation must in the long run keep away wealth from the country, diminish the value of our imports, and lower the general conditions of life in this island. What do you think of that, Watson? cried Holmes in his high glee, rubbing his hands together with satisfaction. Don't you think that is an admirable sentiment? Dr. Mortimer looked at Holmes with an air of professional interest, and Sir Henry Baskerville turned a pair of puzzled dark eyes upon me. I don't know much about the tariff or things of that kind, said he, but it seems to me we've got a bit off the trail so far as that note is concerned. On the contrary, I think we are particularly hot upon the trail, Sir Henry. Watson here knows more about my methods than you do, but I fear that even he has not quite grasped the, grasped the significance of this sentence. No, I confess that I see no connection. And yet, my dear Watson, there is so very close a connection that the one is extracted out of the other. You, your, your, life, reason, value, keep away from the... Don't you see now whence these words have been taken? By thunder, you're right. Well, if that isn't smart, cried Sir Henry. If any possible doubt remained, it is settled by the fact that keep away and from the are cut out in one piece. Well, now so it is. Really, Mr. Holmes... This exceeds anything which I could have imagined, said Dr. Mortimer, gazing at my friend in amazement. 
I could understand anyone saying that the words were from a newspaper, but that you should name which and add that it came from the leading article is really one of the most remarkable things which I have ever known. How did you do it? I presume, doctor, that you could tell the skull of a negro from that of an Eskimo? Most certainly. But how? Because that is my special hobby. The differences are obvious. The supraorbital crest, the facial angle, the maxilla, maxilla, maxillary curves, the... Aha, but this is my special hobby, and the differences are equally obvious. There is as much difference to my eyes between the leaded bourgeois type of a Times article and the slovenly print of an evening halfpenny paper, as there could be between your Negro and your Eskimo. The detection of types is one of the most elementary branches of knowledge to the special expert in crime, though I confess that once when I was very young I confused the Leeds Mercury with the Western Morning News, but a Times leader is entirely distinctive and these words could have been taken from nothing else, as it was done yesterday, and the strong prob probability was that we should find the words in yesterday's issue. As far as I can follow you then, Mr. Holmes, said Sir Henry Baskerville, someone cut out this message with a scissors. Nail scissors, said Holmes. You can see that it is a very short-bladed scissors, and since the cutter had to use two snips over keep away. That is so. Someone then cut out the message with a pair of short bladed scissors, pasted it with paste gum, said Holmes, with gum onto the paper, but I want to know why the word more should have been written. Because he could not find it in print. The other words were all simple and might be found in any issue, but more would be less common. Why, of course, that would explain it. Have you read anything else in this message, Mr. Holmes? There are one or two indications, and yet the utmost pains have been taken to remove all clues. The address, you observe, is printed in rough characters, but the Times is a paper which is seldom found in any hands but those of the highly educated. We may take it, therefore, that the letter was composed by an educated man who wished to pose as an uneducated one, and his effort to conceal his own writing suggests that the writing might be known, or come to be known, by you. Again, you will observe that the words are not gummed on in an accurate line, but that some are much higher than others. Life, for example, is quite out of its proper place. That may point to carelessness, or it may point to agitation and hurry upon the part of the cutter. On the whole, I incline to the latter view, since the matter was evidently important, and it is unlikely that the composer of such a letter would be careless. If he were in a hurry, it opens up the interesting question why he should be in a hurry, since any letter posted up to early morning would reach Sir Henry before he would leave his hotel. Did the composer fear an interruption? And from whom? We are coming now rather into the region of guesswork, said Dr. Mortimer. Say rather that the, into the region where we balance probabilities and choose the most likely. It is the scientific use of the imagination, but we have always some material basis on which to start our speculation. Now, you would call it a guess, no doubt, but I am almost certain that this address has been written in a hotel. How in the world could you say that? If you examine it carefully, you will see that both the pen and the ink have given the writer trouble. The pen had spluttered twice in a single word and has had run dry three times in a short address, showing that there is very little ink in the bottle. Now, a private pen or an ink bottle is seldom allowed to be in such a state, and the combination of the two must be quite rare. But you know that the hotel ink and the hotel pen, where it is rare to get anything else, Yes, I have very little hesitation in saying that could we examine the waste paper baskets of the hotels around Charing Cross until we found the remains of the mutilated Times leader, we could lay our hands straight upon the person who sent this singular message. Hala, hala, what's this? He was carefully examining the foolscape upon which the words were pasted, holding it only an inch or two from his eyes. Well? Nothing, he said, throwing it down. It is a blank half sheet of paper without even a watermark upon it. I think we have drawn as much as we can from this curious letter. And now, Sir Henry, has anything else of interest happened to you since you have been in London? Why, no, Mr. Holmes, I think not. You have not observed any follow or watch you? You have not observed anyone follow or watch you? I seem to have walked right into the thick of a dime novel, said our visitor. Why in thunder should anyone follow or watch me? We are coming to that. You have nothing else to report to us before we go into this matter? 
Well, it depends upon what you think worth reporting. I think anything out of the ordinary routine of life well worth reporting. Sir Henry smiled. I don't know much of British life yet, for I have spent nearly all my time in the States and in Canada. But I hope that to lose one of your boots is not part of the ordinary routine of life over here. You have lost one of your boots? My dear sir, cried Dr. Mortimer, it is only mislaid. You will find it when you return to the hotel. What is the use of troubling Mr. Holmes with trifles of this kind? Well, he asked me for anything out of the ordinary routine. Exactly, said Holmes. However foolish the incident may seem, you have lost one of your boots, you say? Well, mislaid it, anyhow. I put them both outside my door last night, and there was only one in the morning. I could get no sense out of the chap who cleans them. The worst of it is that I only have brought the pair last night in the strand, and I have never had them on. If you have never worn them, why did you put them out to be cleaned? They are tan boots, and have never been varnished. That's why I put them out. Then I understand that on your arrival in London yesterday, you went out at once and bought a pair of boots? I did a good deal of shopping. Dr. Mortimer here went round with me. You see, if I am to be squire down there, I must dress the part, and it may be that I have got a little careless in my ways out west. Among other things, I bought these brown boots, gave six dollars for them, and had one stolen before I even I, ever I had them on my feet. It seems a singularly useless thing to steal, said Sherlock Holmes. I confess that I share Dr. Mortimer's belief that it will not be long before the missing boot is found. And now, gentlemen, said the baronet with decision, it seems to me that I have spoken quite enough about the little that I know. It is time that you kept your promise and gave me a full account of what you are driving at. Your request is a very reasonable one, Holmes answered. Dr. Mortimer, I think you could not do better than to tell your story as you told it to us. Thus encouraged, our scientific friend drew his papers from his pocket and presented the whole case as he had done upon the meeting before. Sir Henry Baskerville, Baskerville listened with the deepest attention and with an occasional exclamation of surprise. Well, I seem to have come into an inheritance with a vengeance, said he, when the long narrative was finished. Of course, I've heard of the hound ever since I was in the nursery. It's the pet story of the family, though I never thought of it taking it seriously before. But as to my uncle's death, well, it all seems boiling up in my head, and I can't get it clear yet. You don't seem quite to have made up your mind whether it's a case for a policeman or a clergyman. Precisely. And now there's this affair of the letter to me at the hotel. I suppose that fits into its place. It seems to show that someone knows more than we do about what goes on up upon the moor, said Dr. Mortimer. And also, said Holmes, that someone is not ill-disposed toward you, since they warn you of the danger. Or it may be that they wish for their own purposes to scare me away. Well, of course, that is also possible. I am very much indebted to you, Dr. Mortimer, for introducing me to a problem which presents several interesting alternatives. But the practical point which we now have decided, Sir Henry, is whether it is or not is, is not advisable for you to go to Baskerville Hall. <coughs> Why should I not go? Well, there seems to be danger. Do you mean danger from this family fiend, or do you mean danger from human beings? Well, that is what we have to find out. Whichever it is, my answer is fixed. There is no devil in hell, Mr. Holmes, and there is no man upon earth who can prevent me from going to the home of my own people. And you may take that to be my final answer. His dark brows knitted, and his face flushed to a dusky red as he spoke. It was evident that the fiery temper of the Baskervilles was not extinct in their last representative. Meanwhile, he said, I have hardly had time to think over all that you have told me. It is a big thing for a man to have to understand and to decide at one sitting. I should like to have a quiet hour by myself to make up my mind. Now, look here, Mr. Holmes, it's half past eleven now, and I am going back right away to my hotel. Suppose you and your friend, Dr. Watson, come round and lunch with us at two. I'll be able to tell you more clearly than how this thing strikes me. Is that convenient with you, Watson? Perfectly. Then you may expect us. Shall I have a cab called? I'd prefer to walk, for this affair has flurried me, rather. I'll join you in a walk with pleasure, said his companion. Then we meet again at two o'clock. Au revoir and good morning.
We heard the steps of our visitors descend the stairs and the bang of the front door. In an instant, Holmes had changed from the languid dreamer to the man of action. Your hat and boots, Watson, quick! Not a moment to lose! He rushed into his room in his dressing gown and was back again in a few seconds in a frock coat. We hurried together down the stairs and into the street. Dr. Mortimer and Baskerville were still visible about two hundred yards ahead of us in the direction of the Oxford Street. Shall I run on and stop them? Not for the world, my dear Watson. I am perfectly satisfied with your company, if you will tolerate mine. Our friends are wise, for it is certainly a very fine morning for a walk. He quickened his pace until we had decreased the distance which divided us by about half. Then, still keeping a hundred yards behind, we followed into Oxford Street, and so down Regent Street. Once our friends stopped and stared into a shop window, upon which Holmes did the same. An instant afterward he gave a little cry of satisfaction, and following the direction of his eager eye, I saw that a handsome cab with a man inside, which had halted on the other side of the street, was now proceeding slowly onward again. "'There's our man, Watson. Come along. We'll have a good look at him if we can do no more.' At that instant I was aware of a bushy black beard and a pair of piercing eyes turned upon us through the side window of the cab. Instantly the trap door of the top flew up, something was screamed to the driver, and the cab flew madly down Regent Street. Holmes looked eagerly, eagerly around for another, but no empty one was in sight. Then he dashed in wild pursuit amid the stream of traffic, but the start was too great and already the cab was out of sight. "'There, now,' said Holmes bitterly, as he emerged panting and white with vexation from the tide of vehicles. "'Was ever such bad luck and such bad management, too? Watson, Watson, if you were an honest man, you will record this also and set it against my successes.' "'Who was that man?' "'I have not an idea. A spy?' "'Well, it was evident from what we have heard that Baskerville has been very closely shadowed by someone since he has been in town.' How else could it be known so quickly that it was the Northumberland Hotel which he had chosen? If they had followed him the first day, I argued that they would follow him also the second. You may have observed that I twice strolled over to the window while Dr. Mortimer was reading his legend. Yes, I remember. I was looking out for loiterers in the street, but I saw none. We are dealing with a clever man, Watson. This, cut, this matter cuts very deep, and though I have not finally made up my mind whether it is a benevolent or a malevolent agency which is in touch with us. I am conscious always of power and design. When our friends left, I at once followed them in the hopes of marking down their visible attendant. So wily was he that he had not trusted himself upon foot, but he had availed himself of a cab so that he could lo so that he could loiter behind or dash past them and no es so escape their notice. His method had the additional advantage that if they were to take a cab, he was all ready to follow them. It has, however, one obvious disadvantage. It puts him in the power of the cabman. Exactly. What a pity we did not get the number. My dear Watson, clumsy as I have been, you surely do not seriously imagine that I neglected to get the number? Number 2704 is our man. But that is of no use to us at the moment. I fail to see how you could have done more. On observing the cab, I should have instantly turned and walked in the other direction. I should then, at my leisure, have hired a second cab and followed the first at a respectful distance, or, better still, have driven to the Northumberland Hotel and waited there. When our unknown had followed Baskerville home, we should have had the opportunity of playing his own game upon him and seeing where he made for. As it is, by an indiscreet eagerness which was taken advantage of with extraordinary quickness and energy by our opponent, we have betrayed ourselves and lost our man. We had been sauntering slowly down Regent Street during this conversation, and Dr. Mortimer with his companion had long vanished in front of us. There is no object in our following them, said Holmes. The shadow has departed and will not return. We must see what further cards we have in our hands and play them with decision. Could you swear that to that man's face within the cab? I could swear only to the beard. And so could I, from which I gathered that in all probability was a false one. A clever man, upon so delicate an errand, has no use for a beard, save to conceal his features. Come in here, Watson. He turned into one of the district messenger offices, where he was warmly greeted by the manager. Ah, oh, Wilson, Wilson, I see you have not forgotten the little case in which I had the good fortune to help you. 
No, sir, indeed I have not. You saved my good name and perhaps my life. My dear fellow, you exaggerate. I have some recollection, Wilson, that you had among your boys a lad named Cartwright who showed some ability during the investigation. Yes, sir, he's still with us. Could you bring him up? Thank you. And I should be glad to have cha changed of this five-pound note. A lad of fourteen, with a bright keen face, had obeyed the summons of his manager. He stood now, gazing with great reverence at the famous detective. Let me have the hotel directory, said Holmes. Thank you. Now, Cartwright, there are the names of twenty-three hotels here, all in the immediate neighborhood of Charing Cross. Do you see? Yes, sir. You will visit each of these in turn. Yes, sir. You will begin in each case by giving the outside porter one shilling. Here are twenty-three shillings. Yes, sir. You will tell him that you want to see the waste paper of yesterday. You will say that an important telegram was miscarried and that you are looking for it. You understand? Yes, sir. But what you are really looking for is the center page of the Times with some holes cut in it with scissors. Here is a copy of the Times. It is this page. You could easily recognize it, could you not? Yes, sir. In each case, the outside porter will send for the hall porter, to whom also you will give a shilling. Here are 23 shillings. You will then learn in possibly 23, 20 cases out of the 23 that the waste of the day before has been burned or removed. In the three other cases, you will be shown a heap of paper, and you will look for this page of the Times among it. The odds are enormously against you finding it. There are ten shillings over in case of emergencies. Let me have a report by wire at Baker Street before evening. And now, Watson, it only remains for us to find out by wire the identity of the cabman, number 2704, and then we will drop into one of the Bond Street picture galleries and fill in the time until we are due at the hotel. That was chapter four. All right, I'm going to take a quick break. I will be right back, guys. Okay, so 